there is a debate now around silk, around reserve powers, around the relationship between tax and spend and so on, and, and that's an important debate that needs to be resolved. I want to take the 85% point of the, the gentleman and just explain in practice the problems that this starts to throw up, because I think it illustrates the fact that devolution is not yet in the DNA of Whitehall. Um, and the, if you take... I, I had the Welsh Government responsibility until March for our relations with the UK Government on welfare reform and social security and pensions issues. Um, and we had different policies applying in Wales from those which were being applied in England as the Department of Work and Pensions was trying to formulate, and still is, of course, trying to formulate, the plans for universal credit. Um, and one of the issues for us is, in Wales, we had kept the education maintenance allowance. In England, it had been abolished. Nobody in the Department of Work and Pensions could tell us whether the education maintenance allowance would be counted within overall family income for the purpose of calculating universal credit. We actually, I actually raised it in a joint ministerial committee, which is one of the you know, cross-governmental institutions established to try and resolve issues like this. And indeed, Lloyd Freud was at the meeting, Nick Clegg was chairing it. I asked a whole series of questions of that kind around the welfare reform proposals. What was interesting at the end was after, after I'd asked these questions, Nick Clegg said, that's interesting, Leighton. I've been asking David Freud some of these questions myself and waiting for the answers, <laughs> which I think bears out some of the things Andrew Adonis says about uh, the role of minority party in a coalition in office, and perhaps, but not in power. There is a similar one, which we had to resolve, which we did actually resolve much earlier, where the Department of Work and Pensions wanted to mandate people who it felt were not um, taking up work opportunities onto our training and education courses in our education institutions in Wales. They didn't have the power to do that. They could easily do it in England because it was an internal government matter. We did not support the philosophy of mandation uh, and conditionality in Wales. In the end, they had to concede that they couldn't do that. But that's what I mean about some of those design problems that happen when you have ministers who have a theoretical, in the case of DWP, British Great Britain responsibility, but have, not, but have designed the system on the basis of the position in England. We have to have a situation, if we're going to have a meaningful uh, new union, it's been, you know, after all, it is 14 years after devolution now, where it is understood within Whitehall uh, that things are different elsewhere, negotiation has to happen, and discussions have to happen early. It's three years uh, since I had my first meeting with Ian Duncan Smith, and a lot of these issues have still not been resolved. I think it's a very interesting issue. I mean, I think that's why it's a dynamic process. I mean, I'm very struck exactly on that point, um, it applies heavily, of course, to Wales, given the, yeah. the, 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 but also applies to Scotland in some ways, between um, reserved and devolved powers. I think how they're coming in absolutely into conflict increasingly. Adam? I, I'm very struck by the, uh, the analogy uh, with um, the countries of the Commonwealth in uh, New Zealand and Canada, and uh, particularly because um, you refer to it in, in your book, didn't you? The, 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 um, the last gasp. Um, uh, uh, imperial unionists who right before uh, right uh, at the end of the Irish crisis started developing these ideas of home rule all round and the British Commonwealth actually the round table group I mean, people uh, from a hundred years ago much like uh, uh, much like David, uh, an interesting eclectic group, they met in Wales, in Plas Newydd, in, in the home of uh, the, uh, the Marcus of Anglesey so there's a Welsh imprimatur to those ideas. They lost Ireland, but they but they actually did gain a Commonwealth. And it's interesting to see Lester Morgan, uh, uh, no no slouch by any standards, uh, actually uh, come up uh, re recently suggest that actually Wales should be aiming for dominion status, which was again one of the ideas that they emerged out of this uh, group. And you know what's interesting. I mean, the Irishman famously said, you know, uh, what is devolution? Devolution is Latin for home rule. And in some ways, I, I sometimes wonder whether David's <laughs> federalism is Latin for independence, you know. Uh, we used to, Gwynvor, Gwynvor Evans used to talk about a Britannic confederation, you know. And these are, are these absolute differences or are they differences in semantics uh, to some extent, you know? I, I wonder. So I, I'm attracted by the idea of a representative democracy for Wales. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the problem, I think, with federalism in its classical form 
is where, yes, when you've got it, where one country which is 85% of the population. I, I don't think there's any way around that, unfortunately. And that's why I think the arrow of history, so in as much as there ever is an arrow of history, is pointed in, in, in our direction, not, not in David's. Because I think that that will be the final resolution. Whether Wales gets there in 5, 10, 15, or 25 years, I can't tell you that. But I think that's the, the direction that we're headed for the reasons that you, you've outlined there, Um I think the English question, you're right, Jenny. You know, there are two English questions. Uh, and we often confuse them. There is the English national question, uh, the democratic def deficit of Engli England as a nation. I think there is an English demos. And then there is the, the question of the regional divide within, within England, you know, the north-south divide, the vast economic gulf that has opened up, you know. Uh, and uh, so I think that is a key issue here. And that brings me on to Maddox's point, you know, who benefits? And this is a key... Uh, I don't think you fully touch upon this, you know. There is a bit of the United Kingdom that has completely detached itself from the United Kingdom. It's gone into outer orbit, into hyperspace. It's called the City of London. It is, with, it is beyond the realms of ordinary accountability, even of the United Kingdom uh, Parliament, which is supposed to be supreme, you know. And therein, I think, lies uh, the rub and part of our problem. You know, I look at Wales today, and I'm sure we sh all share you know, the same feeling, you know. A country, where, country of three million people where there are four million prescriptions for antidepressants annually, you know. Doesn't that say something about where we are? And why is that? Because we are a divided state economically. And, you know, you, you, you referenced the American Civil War. I'm not sure. There was an American War of Independence before that as well, uh, David. But, you know, a house divi divided against itself cannot stand. And that's why I'm not convinced that there is a future for, for, for the United Kingdom. Because unless you address that problem of the economic gulf People in Pembrokeshire, GDP per capita, one tenth of, of you know, in the centre of London, you know, they don't live in this. They don't live in the same social universe, and I don't see the prospectus yet from any unionist which will solve that problem. Right now, we've got we've got we've got a short-term challenge from you, which I think is an absolutely valid one. I mean, you know, we've all got to answer that. But I will do it at the end. So, Adam. Um, the, ne the next uh, three years, um, and then mm -hmm. is it going to come back and again and again and again? Yeah. Are you going to spend the, the, the rest of your life doing it? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not a betting man, but Alex Salmond, of course, is famously, and I certainly wouldn't bet against him. You know, I mean, he was, he was 16 points behind in December uh, 2006, and he came back and uh, uh, won uh, that election. So, um, and, you know... By his side, he has some, some of the best uh, strategists and political organisers in the entire United Kingdom, if not actually in Western Europe at, at the moment. So don't bet against them. Uh, I, think, um, if, I think the vote is going to be close, uh, whatever it is. I don't think that there, there, will, there will be a, uh, you know, a clear no, no vote. Uh, I think that uh, I remember the, 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 the words of, of René Levesque in 1980, you know, as uh, people were, were uh, you know, sort of, Covered, you know, the, the crowd was there, obviously very, very disappointed uh, Quebecois nationalists. And what he said, I, I think I hear what you're telling me. Yes, but not yet. And I think that we may get a version of that uh, if there is a close uh, no vote. And the question will come back. What I think, it, 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 if you want to be uh, completely speculatively, uh, the scenario that Richard uh, just out outlined, it's perfectly possible that Scotland uh, might vote no. And then the United Kingdom in a referendum, as you uh, uh, alluded to, uh, Peter, uh, votes to leave the, Euro the European Union, um, so many different versions of unions around here, uh, and actually then the Scottish, the SNP government brings a new referendum vote in the light of that very, very uh, um, sudden constitutional development. And in that case, I think Scotland would uh, vote to leave the British Union and, and uh, uh, vote to join the European one. Right. Well, I, I, it's not going to... The, the issue in the, in the terms that Hugh has articulated is, 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 is not going to go away, whatever the outcome of a referendum in Scotland. And I, I started this evening by saying I was actually pessimistic. I regarded David as an optimist in terms of what he's projecting. I'm actually pessimistic because I don't think these issues are being articulated in the way that they need to. David has, has helpfully contributed to that process. But I also think there is a significant issue of linkage between a number of these these issues, not just Scotland's place in the Union, but the UK's place in Europe. Um, I am with Richard on, on the whole debate around Englishness. I still first started writing about Englishness back in 1995, and I'm, I am clear that there is 
a suppressed debate there, if you like, which to some extent is being articulated by UKIP. And I think, you know, I think one of the other factors in this kind of cocktail of issues that we, we shouldn't leave out of this is how UKIP performs in the 2014 uh, uh, European elections, what that then gives them as a potential base for further advance, what that d then does as a, dis as a disruptive feature in the political landscape, potentially. Um, and by the way, I don't buy the notion that Wales is a Euro-friendly country. Wales is almost as Eurosceptic, in my view, as, as, as parts of England. Certainly the valleys are very Eurosceptic. So I, I, th I don't think this issue goes away. The polls clearly at the moment in Scotland, I, I, was in, I haven't been in Scotland since December, but the polls, it seems to me, are the moment suggesting, you know, a, the people will, in Scotland will vote against independence. I respect absolutely what Adam says, and 12 months is a long time in politics, and there is, uh, you know, the SNP do have a, a, a very articulate set of campaigners and are, are very good at uh, campaigning. But even if, you know, my perspective is right, they vote, Scotland votes against independence, um, a, it, the issue will not go away in Scotland. Um, it seems to me Alex Salmond is someone put, who's testing his legacy by having to take this forward, having promised the referendum. Um, but they only have to win once, ultimately, for the union to, uh, to, to fall apart. So that issue will come back and come back. But there is a wider context here, which is, goes to what Peter said right at the outset, which is the most important referendum might be a referendum uh, in 2017. But that then begs the question, of course, uh, of a majority conservative government yeah. in 2017, Peter, which of course is not going to happen. No, no, no.